Good morning. My name is Deborah Rutter, and I have the great privilege to be the president of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And together with my boss, our chairman, David Rubenstein, I'm thrilled to welcome you here to this very historic moment and the unveiling of this new exhibit, Art and Ideals, President John F. Kennedy. Look how beautiful it is. We chose today because it marks the Kennedy Center's 51st anniversary. And as the living memorial to President John F. Kennedy, we felt it was important to mark the importance of this day by honoring our past and celebrating our future with this sneak peek as we put the final touches on the exhibit before it opens to the public on September 17. This is the official ceremonial opening, the unveiling, but it is also a sneak peek. Still some work to be done. I really would like to uh, especially welcome our second gentleman, Doug Emhoff. Thank you so much for being here. And you will hear from him shortly, but I am very proud that he has been here to the center so many times in these years. Thank you. I'm also thrilled that President Kennedy's granddaughter, our wonderful friend and board member, Rose Kennedy Schlossberg, is here. Thank you, Rose. And this, this guy who plays the cello, who 60 years ago played for President Kennedy at the first fundraiser for the, the Kennedys, the, the National Cultural Center. Yo-Yo Ma is here with us as well. And um, I'd like to really also recognize an, an individual who has been really inspiring to this work. He and four other historians were served as our advisors as we were trying to figure out how, as a performing arts center, we could develop an exhibit in honor. So Fred Logoval, the most contemporary biographer of JFK. We're thrilled that you're here. Thank you. So you all are our family, our friends, a few friends from outside the world, and we're thrilled to have you here. Um, this is an important occasion for us, and it just is so meaningful for me to have you here. Before we move on the program, uh, with the program, I'd like to um, take a moment and invite Dr. Elizabeth Rule to provide us with a land acknowledgement. Dr. Rule is an assistant professor of critical race, gender, and culture studies at American University, and she is an enrolled citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and a member of the Kennedy Center Social Practice Residency. Thank you, Dr. Rule. Chokma, or hello in the Chickasaw language. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Rule, and I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. It's my pleasure to be here with you all this morning, and I want to extend my deepest gratitude and say chokmashki, thank you, for inviting me to open this event with a land acknowledgement. As we reflect on President Kennedy, the Kennedy Center, and celebrate the opening of this new exhibit, it's clear the role that Washington, D.C. has played in this story and in this narrative. We also do well to remember that Washington, D.C. is on the lands that are the ancestral traditional homelands of the Anacostian, Nacochank, and Piscataway peoples. And it is also the site of a growing, diasporic, diverse, and dynamic indigenous community made up of representatives of more than 500 tribal nations across the United States that has developed over the centuries. As you're here joining with us in this celebration, I would encourage you to learn more about the indigenous lands upon which we're on, and also the contemporary indigenous footprints here in our nation's capital. If you're interested in learning more, you can download the Guide to Indigenous DC mobile application and digital map, which will expose you uh, to these amazing sites all across the District of Columbia. Thank you again for having me, and chokmashki. Thank you, Dr. Rule, and it's so important for us to be able to include you this morning. Thank you. 
For those of us who work in and on behalf of this building, this memorial, the ideas and the ideals of John F. Kennedy provide inspiration and direction in our daily work. We often speak to his legacy and lean into his words as we develop our season plans, make decisions about priorities, and balance myriad opportunities. It is a privilege to bring his ideals further into our physical space and to invite all to understand who he was and what he stood for. This exhibit uses the power of President Kennedy's own remarkable words to explore his presidency, legacy, appreciation, and a promotion of art. It also provides visitors with a greater knowledge and understanding of how the Kennedy Center, our national cultural center, became a living memorial to both President Kennedy and his ideals. As I mentioned, we're closing out our 50th anniversary celebration this month, and the opening of this exhibit is central to that celebration. President and Mrs. Kennedy were dedicated champions of the arts. They believed, as we believe, that the arts play a vital role in American life. This has been a hallmark of our mission since we opened our doors first in 1971. That mission has been guided by the three pillars as stated in our congressional mandate from 1958. First, to bring world-class art to our stages, and art that both reflects the American experience and brings greater understanding of the world around us to the American people. Second, to be the national leader in arts education. And third, to serve as a living memorial to President John F. Kennedy. As the National Cultural Center, the Kennedy Center is entrusted to ensure that our programming represents, recognizes, and supports the broad diversity of our country, and that the arts remain accessible to all. From hip hop to opera, comedy to ballet, we strive to give artists a platform to tell their own stories and narratives that collectively reflect America's unique and diverse cultural and artistic identity. In his historic remarks at Amherst College in 1963, which you'll hear in there too, President Kennedy said, I see little of more importance to the future of our country and our civilization than full recognition of the place of the artist. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision wherever it takes him or her or they. For art to reflect, to truly reflect our great country, we must engage in real cultural leadership, embracing and empowering those who have been historically marginalized and underrepresented, which is why we remain committed to creating social impact and ensuring that the Kennedy Center continues to bridge the past to the future. In the spirit of President Kennedy's vision for a new frontier for the arts, we are also steadfast in our belief that the Kennedy Center is a place for artistic exploration, experimentation, collaboration, and education. From providing resources and professional development programs to arts educators throughout the country to engaging directly with students through one over 40 programs that we offer locally and nationally, our footprint as the national leader in arts education extends to all 50 states and beyond, impacting over one and a half million students annually. As we, I'm hoping that that number will go up a lot when they see how beautiful this exhibit is. It's stunning and it will be a great place for student groups and families to visit as well. As we strive daily to live to our mission, of being a living, the living memorial to President Kennedy and his commitment to the arts, his inspirational words, and his ideals inform all that we do here in this building. This exhibit is fulfilling our mission as a living memorial to President Kennedy and his values of service, justice, freedom, courage, and gratitude. Through this new 7,500 square foot exhibit behind me, we hope to continue to educate and inspire and to find new ways to embody President Kennedy's ideals. Using immersive mediums and digital technology, 
we explore how the arts infused and informed John F. Kennedy's presidency. And we trace the power of the arts in influencing politics, culture, and style during the Kennedy lifetime. We also share our own story of how the Kennedy Center came to be from President Kennedy's commitment to ensuring that a national cultural center be built to a grateful nation and Congress who ensured that once erected, the center serve as a living memorial to our fallen president. In preparing for this exhibit, our team worked with five different historians to ensure that we were authentically representing who President Kennedy was as a person and as a president. After all, we're a performing arts center, not a museum. And to really focus on his ability to create connections for people to the arts and through the arts. As we look to the next 50 years, it is my sincerest hope that this exhibit will impact all visitors, but especially those who are too young to have had a personal connection to President Kennedy. To better understand the impact he had on our country and our relationship to the arts, and in setting ideals for who and what Americans can be. This is what it means to be a living memorial to President Kennedy, and I hope you enjoy this unveiling, this preview today. So finally, before I hand this over, I would like to take a moment to express my gratitude to all of our partners who worked so closely with us over the past years to make this exhibit possible. To our designers, Stephen Kieran, Richard Maiman, David Feaster of Kieran Timberlake, Linda and Megan, who have really great, very difficult to pronounce last names, <laughs> of a really great organization called Batwin and Robin, Richard Tay of Green Eye, and especially Abbott Miller of Pentagram. Thank you. To our historians, Fred Logoval, thank you for being here, representing your colleagues, Annette Gordon-Reed, Peniel Joseph, Scott Sandage, and Penny Vonneshen, who will be here in the next couple of weeks. To Consigli, our general contractor, who, was work, who has worked diligently and who is still going to be doing some more work for the next few weeks, thank you. To our government partners, our federal and non-federal staff, without whom we could have done this at all, and to my superstar staff. We had a large working team who I will thank personally a little bit later, but the team who were our day-to-day, day-in, day-out collaborators who gave and gave and gave and slept here for the last few nights, I want to say thank you to Ellery Brown, to Carissa Ferrugi, to Alicia Adams, Sophia Becerra, Sean McNally, Bob Selipan and our fearless project manager, whose goodwill, generous smile, ready joke, and boundless optimism kept us going. Thank you, Logan Garrett. Now you can clap. <laughs> this was a true labor of love, a commitment to the leg legacy of John F. Kennedy, and an honor for us to give back to our country. Thank you for helping us to create this exhibit, to inspire us, for being here to celebrate this moment. And thank you all for all that you do for this country and for the Kennedy Center. It's now my privilege to introduce our board chair, David Rubenstein. Wow. Deborah forgot to thank one person who's done an incredible amount to make this possible, and that is Deborah Rudder herself. Um, she worked tirelessly to make sure that this date would actually be one we could actually show you things. Um, some of you uh, have been involved in the Kennedy Center for a long time. I see Alma Gildenhorn, who's been here from the very beginning. Thank you, member of our board. Uh, served as our chair for a while, and also she was here at the very beginning of the Kennedy Center uh, a few years ago. Uh, some of you may say to yourself, why did I get an invitation to an exhibition about President Kennedy 51 years after the Kennedy Center opened? Anybody ever think about that? Well, let me tell you the answer. Uh, the truth is, 
the Ken President Kennedy really worked hard to build a National Cultural Center. He obviously didn't intend it to be named after him. The idea had been passed by Congress in 1958. And uh, in those days, Congress didn't give you very much money for these kinds of things, so there was no money from the federal government. All was to be raised uh, privately. Uh, the private sector didn't rush in to raise money uh, for this, and a net total of $13,000 was raised in three years. So when President Kennedy came in, he said, OK, I'm going to be serious about getting this money raised. And what we're going to do is bring somebody down from New York who has a lot of experience in cultural affairs. He's been a Broadway producer and knows a lot about finance. He was a real estate person as well. And that was Roger Stevens, who served later for 28 years as the chairman and effectively the president and chairman at the same time of the Kennedy Center. And he helped get this uh, building built in part by having national telethons, one of which, as you can look on YouTube, as I've done many times, and you'll see a seven-year-old Yo-Yo Ma performing uh, at one of the national telethons, and uh, he was pretty good. I thought he had a, had a chance of going somewhere. Uh, and the rush to build this was, uh, was pretty considerable in Washington, D.C., but it, Washington doesn't, things don't move that quickly, so the legislation passed in 1958, and it opened as the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in 1971. So you might say, 58 to 71, why does it take so long? Well, obviously, there were questions about the site, whether it's an appropriate place to, to build it. It, it, it uh, started, then they stopped, and so forth. And also, they had to raise uh, a lot more money than they had originally thought. Today, this building were built from scratch. I suspect it would cost roughly $2 billion. But the cost of the building at the time was $70 million. That's all it cost. Uh, half of that actually came from the federal government, and half of it came from contributors, many of whom were represented here. Countries uh, gave uh, um, some, some financial support and also gave cultural objects, and many of those are still here. But why do we now, 51 years later, finally have an exhibition about President Kennedy? Well, this is uh, what happened. In the rush to get this building built and to operate it for the last 51 years, we tried to build it, and my predecessors tried to build it into the leading performing arts center in the world. And clearly, while some people at other places might think they're the leading performing arts center in the world, we know that we are the leading <laughs> one. And uh, it's been incredible. We've, we've come on the cultural scene relatively late in the, in the grand scheme of things. There are, performing arts centers in Europe that have been around for hundreds of years, and, they're, uh, and New York has a place uh, as well um, that you might have heard of. But what Kennedy Center has done in these 50-some years is to make itself one of the most important performing arts centers in the world, and not just because people see the Kennedy Center honors on television in, in December and come here. It's an incredible event and it makes people know about us. But we have 2,000 plus events a year, 2 million people come a year, 2 million people come a year just to tour the Kennedy Center. And we realized uh, not too long ago that many people that come here don't really know who President Kennedy was. Two thirds of the people living in this country were not alive when President Kennedy was president, two thirds. My own children in their early 30s, um, when I talked about the Kennedy Center and President Kennedy, their eyes glaze over. They don't really know what he did. And so it's, they're not that unique. And so over the years, I've thought, and other people have thought, what we should do is make sure people, when they come to the Kennedy Center, have a chance to learn more about President Kennedy and his commitment to the arts, which, which was not just a peripheral uh, concern of his. He really did care about the arts, and obviously uh, the First Lady did as well. And the cultural uh, events that they held are still being talked about some 50 plus years later. The Nobel Prize dinner, the, the dinner for Pablo Casals at the White House, um, there aren't that many administrations where you're still talking about the cultural events they held 50 years later or 25 years later. They were really interested in the arts in a way that uh, I think it's a great um, roadmap for future leaders as well because the arts are so important to our society. And so we had a strategic planning committee at, at the at Kennedy Center and like most strategic planning committees, they come up with ideas from time to time and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. In this case, it was a terrific idea. The idea the, the committee was chaired by Janet Hill, who passed away, sadly, just a few weeks ago, and by John Goldman from San Francisco. And one of the ideas that came out of that committee was, let's have a permanent exhibition that actually lets people know not only what all the accomplishments were of President Kennedy and his administration, but the cultural accomplishments, the things that he did to promote the arts in the United States and around the world. And so that was the beginning of the idea. 
Uh, it's now taken quite a while to put it together. This will be a permanent exhibition. And when you tour it, as I did a little while ago, I think you will feel very emotional about the fact that we had such a gifted young leader unfortunately struck down in the prime of life at the age of 46. We can only imagine what he would have done had he uh, lived uh, to serve uh, the rest of his term and a, and a second term and what he would have done post-presidency. It's incredible to see the vitality, the brilliance, the wit, the humor, uh, and the love of the arts that you'll see in these, um, in, in all of the exhibitions here. And this is something that will, not only for those of you who are gonna tour it today, but those who are gonna tour it for the remaining uh, years of the Kennedy Center will see uh, what an incredible person he was. And my children and others will now say, now I understand why the Kennedy Center is named for President Kennedy. Now I can see why he deserved to have this name after him. And now I can see why it, why it is that we should all be proud as Americans to have had President Kennedy serve as our leader uh, for a thousand days, and why we're so proud to have the Kennedy Center as a living memorial to this incredible president. And so um, I hope all of you will enjoy it and feel as emotional about it as I did when I toured it, because it brought back memories to me. I was uh, in the 10th grade when he was, uh, his life was taken away, and I, I you know, never quite forgot that, and I'm sure all of you who are alive then remember exactly where you were when you were told about it, and you'll never forget it. And so um, it's a really terrific occasion. I want to thank all of you for coming here today uh, to help us celebrate and mark this before the rest of the public gets to see it. And I guarantee you, when people come to Washington in the future, they will make certain that they come to the Kennedy Center not, not just to see a show, not just to see a performance, but to see this exhibition. Because I've seen many great exhibitions in Washington and many great museums, but this one is really at the top. And I want to thank all of those who put it together and all the hard work that was put in to make certain that it was open, available today, because I know people were fixed, finishing it uh, a few hours ago. So, um, <laughs> but thank you. And I want to especially thank one person who's come here uh, today and that is the second gentleman of the United States, Doug M. Hall. Um, he has done another uh, heroic thing himself by creating a new role. We've never had a second gentleman before, and as you try to create a new role, it's, that's obviously not easy to do, but he's done a spectacular job of performing that role, and I, I think he's uh, a person who's really fit into Washington, D.C. quite well, teaching now at Georgetown Law School on other responsibilities that he has, and I'm very honored that you would come here uh, uh, Doug, and uh, come here and make some brief remarks. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, thank you all for coming. Doug? Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of President Biden, my wife, Vice President Harris, and the entire Biden-Harris administration, it is such an honor to be here today at this opening and to see this incredible Arts and Ideals exhibit before all of you. Um, it was just fantastic. I can't wait for you to see it. I'll, I'll preview some of it in the remarks. But um, uh, Chairman Rubenstein, you are such a, a leader, not only here at the Kennedy Center, but I've, I see you all over town and uh, in rooms, uh, big and small, you care so much about this city, this country, and this world. So thank you for all you do. It, it just means a lot. <laughs> President Rutter, we've gotten to know each other uh, pretty well over these last couple of years, and one of the best things about being second gentleman is I get to come to the Kennedy Center a lot for events, large and small, and it's one of those surreal moments of many surreal moments of being second gentleman that I get to be here uh, a lot and I've gotten to know you. So thank you for all you do. This job is not easy and you make it look easy. And I've also gotten to know a lot of the, the staff here at the Kennedy Center. Uh, thank you for all you do. Uh, it's amazing the, the variety of events that you do here and you do it with such skill and you're always smiling. So thank you for that. Um, Rose Kennedy Schlossberg, I've gotten to meet you a couple of times. It's a, quite an honor to, to see you seeing this. It must be quite emotional and incredible 
for you to see your, your grandfather, grandmother uh, in this way. So I can't wait to, to hear your remarks and, and thank you for being here and thank you for your leg, uh, commitment to furthering the, the family's commitment to the arts. So thank you for, for what you've done and what you're about to be doing. So another really great thing about being second gentleman was I got to be at the White House yesterday for the unveiling of the Obama portraits. And that was quite an event. David was there, of course. Maybe some of you were there. And it, it got me thinking about another famous portrait at the White House. Of course, it's the portrait of John F. Kennedy. And it made me think about when I took my now 80-something-year-old parents on a tour of the White House. And when we got to that famous picture, and my mom and dad just looked at it and stopped and looked at it in awe. And my mom said, that's our president. And it, I, I've just not forgotten that moment. And um, being here today just made me think of what he meant to them and millions of people of their generation and millions of people around the world. And to be able to now present to this new generation of what they felt and what David talked about all these years later is really something. John F. Kennedy, uh, again, a lot of us knew, knew who he was, but uh, many who don't, was um, he was a symbol of hope in a world that really needed hope. He was a symbol of change in a world that really needed change. And he was a champion, and you'll see some civil rights uh, exhibits in there. He really was a champion. Um, at a time when the world needed a champion, and this country needed a champion uh, for civil rights, but beyond that, for our ideals, our ideals as Americans, and what this country could be and what this world could be. And that's who he was. And this exhibit really shows that. He really shows what this, it, that administration was about, that it was forward-looking, that it was all about making the world a better place and lifting people up instead of what we see so often now of beating people down. Isn't that something? The ability to lift people up and that's what we need and that's what he was doing. Um, we talk about the arts and a lot of this exhibit is about the arts. Of course, we're at the Kennedy Center and um, I am passionate about the arts and that did not just happen when I became second gentleman. <laughs> Uh, as some of you may know, I'm really an entertainment lawyer from LA. So I spent, uh, I spent my entire career uh, working in arts and entertainment as a lawyer. So this is something that is near and dear to me, and it's something that I will work on. I have worked on as second gentleman. I will continue to work on as second gentleman. And arts are always going to be a top priority in my life, and they will continue to be uh, for me as long as I'm in this administration. I promise you that, Deborah. Um, I've been able to do some amazing things uh, as second gentleman within the arts. Um, I'll tell you one story of, uh, I went to Milwaukee. There was a youth um, uh, center's symphony, Mr. Ma, and I got to see some amazing, amazing, amazing performers. And it just showed, the, the real point of this story is to show the impact of art at all times, but really during the pandemic. So this is when everything was really closed up and kids were taking classes virtually and needed, needed some outlets. And this, uh, this facility in, in uh, Milwaukee where I met this performer named Clark, who was still able to play the violin and study and play at a high level and express himself artistically at the height of the pandemic was really something quite to see, and you could really feel that healing power of the arts that we all know most of the time, but especially during the pandemic. Um, it was truly, truly, truly amazing, because we all know that the arts just have this unique ability to help us understand and help us achieve challenges that are put in front of us and just open up the world in a different way. But arts, as we know, have the ability to unite us. They have the ability to inspire us, foster conversations, foster different understandings. Deborah, you and I were talking about that just in the room, uh, about what the arts mean to so many different, so many different issues. 
And President Kennedy understood that. He understood the importance of arts, as was mentioned. And he also believed that we should be a nation that invests in art. You know, I think the Vice President always says it's not STEM, it's STEAM. Adding the arts, adding the A into that, because that's what we need to do. And as a representative of the Biden-Harris administration, I gotta put in a plug, um, we are carrying on that, that legacy. Uh, the American Rescue Plan had provisions and some of the other bills that have been passed have had provisions that put money into the arts, uh, open venues, help venues that had been shuttered, helped uh, people who worked in the arts community, around the arts community, and we're gonna continue to do that because again, we know arts inspire us, unite us, and it's something that we need to help lift us up in a world where so many feel small and so many feel beaten down. We need the arts to lift us up. Uh, the administration's new budget for 2023 proposes another $201 million investment in the National Endowment of the Arts, which is pretty good. So we're gonna to continue to do everything we can as an administration, but just uh, a couple of words about what you're about to see. Um, I, I think it's stunning to, to all the folks who worked on it, bravo. It's, it's, so, it's got a combination of, of artifacts and, and interactive things. And one of the things that you'll see, I'll, I'll do a little preview, um, is the President's, President Kennedy's famous speech at Rice University talking about space and talking about what can be and talking about, we, you know, if we, don't, we do things, you know, because they're hard and we're gonna get to the moon and it's just so striking because as we speak right now, my wife, the Vice President, head of the Space Council, is on her way to Houston to have a Space Council meeting. So long arc of history. Uh, it's an honor to be here, Deborah. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, sorry. Um, it, one of the great pleasures of the role that I have is meeting extraordinary people. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And Rose, thank you for being here. Um, I met Rose at the very beginning of my tenure when she helped us break ground for the REACH back in December of 2014. And every time we had a meeting about that project, Rose was a part of it. She has been an active member of our board. She has been here. Every time we ask her to come and do something, she's Rose and she has this responsibility of having Kennedy in her middle name and having these amazing grandparents but Rose, as an individual, as an artist, as uh, a person of unique ideas, important ideas, we are grateful to you for being Rose, and thank you for also being here to represent your family. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, um, I'm so pleased to be with you all today to celebrate the preview of this exhibit dedicated to my grandfather, President John F. Kennedy. Thank you to David Rubenstein, Deborah Rudder, and all the staff, exhibit designers, and contractors who worked tirelessly over the past seven years to make this exhibit a reality. I'm also grateful to our second gentleman, Doug Emma, for joining us in today's celebrations. Uh, as all of you know, the Kennedy Center has been a living memorial to my grandfather since it opened its doors in 1971. And while his spirit remains strong and present throughout the Kennedy Center, from artwork depicting his likeness to inspirational words that are etched on the walls outside, there has never been a place within the Kennedy Center to really learn about him until now. This new permanent exhibit allows all of us to learn about who he was both as a person and a president. Children can learn about my grandfather as a boy, about the books he read, and the impact that his love of language imprinted on him for the rest of his life. Americans can learn about the drive that both my grandfather and my grandmother had in making this building a reality, and their commitment to ensuring that a national cultural center be built. And all visitors to the center can now learn how my grandfather fundamentally understood the important role that art plays in our individual lives, and that a shared artistic experience 
can become a shared human experience. In November of 1962, in a televised event that kicked off the fundraising campaign for this building, where a seven-year-old Yo-Yo Ma performed for my grandparents and other guests, President Kennedy gave a speech in which he said the following. Thus today, as always, art knows no national boundaries. Genius can speak at any time, and the entire world will hear it and listen. Behind the storm of daily conflict and crisis, the dramatic confrontations, the tumult of political struggle, the poet, the artist, the musician continues the quiet work of centuries, building bridges of experience between peoples, reminding man of the universality of his feelings and desires and despairs, and reminding him that the forces that unite are deeper than those that divide. As we gather here today, 60 years after he gave that speech, his words remain just as relevant, impactful, and truthful as they were in 1962. May we all continue to look for opportunities to find the forces that unite us, and may we all seek out opportunities for art to continue to build bridges of experience between peoples. I am grateful to the Kennedy Center for the creation of this exhibit that shares my grandfather's humanity, his genius, and his legacy with generations to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you. Um, dear friend, nobody at the Kennedy Center is ever going to not know how old you are. <laughs> He's not this young guy who played at that event. He was the seven-year-old who played 60 years ago. Not quite. Um, an, uh, Yo Yo is another close, close friend, not just to the Kennedy family, to the Kennedy Center, to everybody he meets, who thinks he's their best friend. And it is that generosity of spirit that belief in the goodness of humanity and his uh, boundless, if I may use the word again, um, commitment to ensuring that the world become a better place by calling for and inviting artists to engage more openly. He is the original citizen artist of our era although he hearkens back to all of the cities and artists of uh, generations, centuries before. And as a citizen artist, he often says yes when the Kennedy Center calls. So thank you, Mr. Yo-Yo Ma, for being here today. Thank you, Deborah. I think you're our citizen president and CEO of the Kennedy Center. And I want you to know that I am the old guy who plays the cello, who used to be the young guy that played the cello. And um, as a cellist, I would like to hearken to a time 61 years ago, on November 1st, 1961, when Pablo Casals famously played his concert at the White House, which David Rubenstein refers to because it is in our cultural memory. The reason Pablo Casals was invited to the White House was because he actually refused to play in any country post-World War II that recognized Franco's government. So it's in opposition to a totalitarian regime that he stopped playing. He made one exception, which is to play at the Kennedy White House because he admired what the president and his administration was trying to do in the world. And he was inspired 
by the actions of the administration that made him break his own promise to not play publicly. So that was an incredible event uh, that we still talk about. And today, I would like to hearken back to that time because the last piece he played was this piece that to Casals and to the people of Catalonia. He was a proud Catalan. He played this piece, a folk song called The Song of the Birds. And to all Catalans and for Casals, it meant freedom. Birds fly across boundaries. They're in fact migrating right now. They're free to do so because we don't put human boundaries, walls, and silos in their path. And I believe that this exhibit and the work of the Kennedy Center and of our chairman, of our board member, of our first gentleman, of all the people, sorry, second gentleman, well, in my book, <laughs> that's a victory sign. <laughs> Um, so that I, I, I believe that this work with the exhibit that you're about to see is going to continue to inspire generations of people and not just inspire but renew our faith in something that we believe in deeply as in working toward a world that is a goal that is bigger than ourselves and that's worth the commitment of our head, heart, soul, and hands to do constantly. So the song of the birds, um, hopefully with a cello. <laughs> My voice is not what it used to be.
it's really important for us to collectively mark these historic moments and for you all to be with us is really important. I'd like to invite Abbott Miller from Pentagram, Alicia Adams, who has a fantastic series of stories to tell about growing up in Washington, and she is our Vice President of International Programming and Dance, Fred Logeval, um, our historian, and David Rubenstein, who's the world's greatest interviewer. Lower your expectations, not, gonna, not that good. So, uh, Deborah, when did you realize this was actually gonna get done on time? This morning, or? 10.01. Uh, 10.01, .01. okay. No, no we, we have a fantastic team who have been working nonstop. And um, uh, to be walking through here time after, you know, many times a day for, for weeks and weeks, um, I'd look at Abbott and he'd say, yeah, yeah, it's really great. So Abbott, uh, there are a lot of artifacts in here. I, where did you get these artifacts? <laughs> Well, part of the challenge of this was actually producing the show during the pandemic. So a lot of the institutions that we reached out to were really not functioning. So we turned to eBay um, for a surprising number of artifacts. And, uh, you know, I think we also got significant loans and facsimiles from the JFK Library. Um, but it was quite interesting as a challenge to produce a show that really had a feeling of so richness and detail. When you go on eBay, can you say, well, this is for the country, it's for the Kennedy Center, and you get a discount, or that doesn't work that way? It didn't work that way? No, there's no uh, eBay Prime. No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Frederick, um, you are now working on the second volume of your uh, very large uh, work on President Kennedy. In the first volume, which you and I have talked about before, this, I forget, five or 600 pages. Can you summarize in a paragraph or two um, everything in your first book about President Kennedy, which inspired you to want to write a book about him and to write two books about him? What is it about President Kennedy that inspired you? You're a native of Stockholm. Why did you decide to write a book about this American president? Well, um, you know, for one thing, uh, David, he is, I think, a, a hugely consequential figure. Yeah, in our in our in our nation's history, in the world's history, and to try to understand him and where he came from, this large Irish Catholic family, and how he then ultimately reached the biggest prize of all, namely the White House, was just a challenge that I could not resist. I also had a sense that, and we've talked a little bit about this already. You've heard about this from people already. That he's an extraordinary figure. Uh, he is, uh, one of the things that I realized, David, in the research, which I think cuts against what many people may understand about John F. Kennedy, is that he was from an early age deeply interested in the world, deeply interested in history. He's a, he's a serious guy who took serious things seriously. And finally, to summarize, yes, a big book, um, the materials that we have available at the John F. Kennedy Library are superb. And I was a kid in a candy store, as a historian and as a biographer, I could go in, it's just down the street from where I teach, I could go in and see box after box after box of family correspondence. There's a letter, say, from Jack to Bobby, there's one from his father to him, his friends writing to him and, and, and he to they. And then his travel diaries, for example, which we discussed when we talked about the first volume. It's a very rich story. Uh, it is, in my view, the great American story, and it's an honor to be able to tell it. Now, he um, hosted a dinner with Jacqueline Kennedy for the living Nobel Prize winners in the United States, which hadn't been done before and hasn't been done, honestly, since then. Uh, whose idea was that, and what was it like to be at that dinner? I just can imagine, I think there were 49 of them, think about this, 49 of them present here with the president and the first lady, various other dignitaries. dignitaries. Um, you know, he mused about the idea, why don't we try to bring in uh, at least a selection of very serious thinkers and writers, have them here at the uh, White House. I have a feeling though, David, 
and this is something I still need to nail down for the second volume, that the first lady, who by the way deserves great credit for everything you're gonna about, you're about to see today, uh, Jackie Kennedy, and this is something we talked about in our Zoom conversations about this exhibit, she is so important to all of this. I think she said, Jack, this is something that we really should be doing. Uh, call it a kind of collaborative uh, decision. Okay. And I thought you were going to say you admired his hair particularly. Now that, that wasn't part of what uh, you admired him for? Admiration is maybe not the word that I would use. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> but an extra, by the way, um, a, a not insignificant reason for his success as a politician, especially when he ran for Congress as a very young man, was indeed the hair. It worked for him. Not that I would know anything about that. So, Alicia, you were at President Kennedy's uh, famous speech at American University, and I gather your parents were at the March in Washington, so you were too young to remember much about what he said at American University, but is it any memory that you have of him or the speech? Well, it was my mother's graduation from American University, and so we all, my sister and I, both went to that graduation. We were kids when we, when we went, but um, there was an excitement. It was held outdoors, um, and just all of the, the people that were, that were there. Uh, it was very exciting. Everybody was very excited about this, this young president um, who was now their graduation speaker. So yes, I, I did right. grow up in, in Washington, but I, I lived a lot of my life in, in New York City, which is where I met many of the um, people that are represented in the, in the exhibition. Uh, people like Harry Belafonte, whom I, whom I worked for, and had many opportunities to talk to about um, the civil rights movement, or Alvin Ailey, um, the American Dance Theater. Alvin and I worked very closely together and had many conversations about the work that he was doing and what he was representing in terms of his, his company. So I think in terms of my participation on this panel, which had been on, on this panel, but also with the historians, is, is that I brought some insights, um, some personal insights from those experiences to the, to the table. Um, as we talked about, I know this is longer than what you asked me, but as we, <laughs> as, as we talked about uh, John F. Kennedy, one of the things we wanted to make sure to do was to have this exhibition be authentic, an authentic representation right. of who he was, and not to lionize him, but to be able to, to do this in a way that was you know, honest and, um, and elegant at the same time. Okay, Abbott, um, much of the exhibition is about his cultural, um, the cultural aspects of his life, and, but a lot of it is about other things as well. How did you divide uh, between the, the, the space allocated to justice or foreign policy and the space allocated to cultural affairs, which is obviously what the Kennedy Center is mostly focused on. How did you divide the, the two? Well, I think working with the historians as our kind of council, um, we really found all the points of intersection in each of those themes where the arts were really central to each of those stories. So even when we pivot to the civil rights movement, it's really through the lens of the artists and writers who were sort of part of the galvanizing force behind Kennedy and helping frame his reactions. So really each of those stories does pivot around some connection to the arts and that was a story that as we developed it, we realized had not really been told very fully anywhere. So it was a, an exciting project in that we're really not just reporting on something but bringing it to life sort of for the first time. I mean, we all associate Kennedy with the arts, but this, this sort of the why starts to come become a lot clearer in this exhibition. Okay, Deborah, when, people, when will this exhibition open to the public? It, um, through this week and next, we are inviting all of you to invite your friends to help us understand how it works. And then we'll have the big public opening next Saturday, simultaneous to the performances of Bernstein's Mass that we are producing. Um, uh, again, um, that was the opening in 1971, and we felt like having this exhibit and the, this next production would all be perfect together. So the big public opening will be um, next okay. Saturday. And if somebody wants to go to the exhibition, is there a ticket charge? No, this is open every single day 
12 to 12 noon to midnight. So we're thrilled to welcome people at any time. And uh, who helped pay for this exhibition? This is a part of the Living Memorial. In fact, in some ways, we believe that we're fulfilling that mandate even further now with this. So we have been working closely with the federal government, and it is fully paid for by the federal government through our annual capital expenditure right. that okay. they appropriate to us. And we've accrued those dollars over all of these years so that it's fully funded. Okay. So, um, Frederick, uh, do you think President Kennedy would have said, ask not what the Kennedy Center can do for you, but what you can do for the Kennedy Center? you think he would have come up with a line like that? He probably would have come up with something even, or at least close to this. I think, as I went through it today, David, uh, and Abbott and I talked about various things, it is an extraordinary thing. And I do feel very confident in saying that if the president, he would be a hundred and five or six, five. which is not inconceivable. If he could go through that thing today, I think he would be extraordinarily proud of what it, what it, what it does, um, as you're all about to see. Um, so that's one thing I feel confident about. So uh, President Kennedy was the last president we had who was not born in a hospital, is that right? He was born in a home. Yeah. Born at home in Brookline, yes. Brookline. And um, where did he get that accent? Because, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I know a lot of people who grew up in Brookline and Massachusetts, but I've never really heard, other than some people in his family, have that accent. Was that practiced, or how did he get that accent? You know, I don't know if it was practiced. There is an extraordinary tape that you guys, anybody can find if they want on YouTube. Archivists at Harvard found this in some dusty box somewhere, a recording of the sophomore John F. Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, taking a public speaking class at Harvard as a sophomore. Um, and what struck me about listening to that tape is he's, what, 20 years old, let's say. Um, the accent, it's, it's a stronger, as I read it, as a non-New uh, Englander, a stronger New England accent that he had then. Um, and it changed over time, which is not a very good answer to your question. But the tape, right. that gives us the young Jack Kennedy. Hey, if you look at the pictures in here, you'll see a lot of individuals from that era, of course, and particularly President Kennedy, they all strike me as very thin. Um, <laughs> why were so, people, so many people so thin in those days? Processed well, food was yeah, not uh, a thing. Less, less television, less you know, being couch potatoes. Um, the Kennedy family, uh, Joe Sr. and Rose, uh, emphasize the importance of physical fitness. So none of the Kennedy kids uh, were going to be, uh, shall we say, somewhat overweight. Uh, they were going to be trim. They were going to be athletic. That was drilled into them. Um, so that's how I'd explain the Kennedy. Hey, so um, the historians sometimes get to ask questions of people who they write about, but obviously in President Kennedy, in case you couldn't, if you could ask President Kennedy any one question, what would you want to ask him? I guess, oh boy, I, I suppose, because I'm thinking now about volume two, which I'm in the midst of, I think I would ask him what he planned to do, maybe not with respect to Vietnam, which is the question I always get, what would he have done in Vietnam? I think I have a, an answer to that one. I believe, however, that the larger Cold War, David, he was in the midst of rethinking, with some help from Nikita Khrushchev. I think I would ask him, what do you uh, what do you intend to do in your second term uh, with respect to this battle against communism? I think he was fundamentally rethinking the Cold War. And in the Cuban Missile Crisis, did his wife say to him, I'm staying with you and the children, and did they actually think a nuclear bomb could be launched? And what did they do to prepare for that eventuality? Uh, it's apocryphal, perhaps, but my understanding is that she said precisely that, or ver words to that effect. I think he felt, I think the other members of the executive committee, his key advisors, felt that it was very possible, in fact, that they would not wake up tomorrow, uh, especially in those tense early days of the crisis. What's remarkable about John F. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis is that from an early point, he insisted on the need to find a political settlement to this, insisted on the need to avoid nuclear Armageddon, and I don't think it's too much to say 
that we can all be grateful, all of us in this room today, for the fact that John F. Kennedy was present, president in October of 1962 because he insisted uh, that this thing must be settled short of, uh, of war. And toward the end of his life, the li limited test ban treaty was negotiated. Right. It is said by some, I think Ted Sorensen, that was what he regarded as his greatest single accomplishment. Is that right? I think it is. And again, when I talked earlier about rethinking the Cold War, this was one piece of that. And I think he felt that that limited test ban agreement uh, in the late summer of 1963, so just a few months before his death, was indeed one of his signature accomplishments. So Alicia, why did movie stars and performing artists seem to like President Kennedy so much? They seemed to gravitate toward him in a way that we hadn't seen before. Right, at, at that time, um, sports stars, uh, movie stars were um, paramount in, in, in the United States. They really had platforms um, that they could use to, to, to speak. They were more and, important than private equity people. <laughs> <laughs> per, perhaps in terms of getting a message okay. across. And so what, what happened not. when, when uh, Ronald Reagan um, uh, was, was, was it Reagan? Nixon, Nixon, sorry. Nixon was running against President uh, Kennedy. He, he went to Jackie Robinson and asked for Jackie Robinson's support. So Harry Belafonte was one of the, the most celebrated um, artists at that time. And Jack Kennedy came to, to Harry to ask for his help in terms of delivering the African-American African -American vote. So that's how their relationship um, began. And that time, uh, African-Americans didn't have the right to vote to the extent that they later got it. But those African-Americans who were able to vote tended to vote to a large extent Republican because Lincoln had been a Republican. Therefore, there weren't, wasn't a gigantic African-American vote for Democrats. Is that right at that time? That's correct. That's, okay. that's right. So, okay, Abbott, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Um, when you do one of these things, do you ever um, do focus groups to think about what you should put in there? How do you decide what you're going to put in there? And when do you know if it's successful or not? Well, I think the, one of the reactions yesterday was really moving. It was one of the design partners. Uh, his wife came through and was in tears. And we've been working with the material for so long that you know you kind of get habituated to it. So okay. seeing a fresh reaction like that was a real confirmation. And I think that that you know um, the the historical advisors were really key to helping us get a sense of balance and rightness and authenticity. But when it came to like the sort of um, question of what to bring into the show, I think it was at the very beginning the idea that you need to hear his voice and hear that intelligence and the sort of his gift as an orator. And I think that's why media is a pretty central part of the exhibition right. because at the top of the list we wanted people to understand his art was speaking. Mm -hmm. And that you know there's great writing but his delivery <laughs> is pretty amazing and I think that is what right. you hear in the show is that his his talent and his passion about text. Okay. So, Deborah, should we cut the Let's ribbon? Let's cut the ribbon. Cut Let's the ribbon. go see it. And cut the ribbon. <laughs>